Ooh. Megan's got a great headshot, huh? <laughs> we got, we got, we're already up to like 130. I see. Yeah. Okay, are we ready to start? Yeah, yeah I'd say uh, good to start. People are slowly going to be trickling in still, I think, but I think we're good to go. Okay, great. On behalf of the Salem Center and the Department of Finance, I would like to welcome everyone to, the, to, the, to today's discussion. Um, my name is Sheridan Tippmann, and I'm the chair of the Finance Department. Our special guest today is Larry Harris, who has been a close friend of mine for over 30 years. I think it will be clear from the discussion that Larry is very well placed to explain exactly what I will refer to as the GameStop situation. In addition to being a professor at the University of Southern California, Larry is a former chief economist of the SEC, as well as being a board member of Interactive Brokers. I think I'd like to start by saying that most of the audience is probably aware of the evolving GameStop story and what we can what can be categorized as a battle between hedge funds and a mob of Reddit retail investors. Okay, what I think we don't completely understand is short selling um, and how I would characterize as the archaic mechanics of short selling, how that contributed to the situation. So Larry, I'd like to start by asking you to, you know, first explain what short selling is, um, why short selling can be important for the well efficient, for the efficiency of a well-functioning financial market. Um, Larry? Sure. Well, thank you very much, Sheridan, for inviting me to join you. And uh, it's uh, truly been a pleasure to know you over these years and look forward to many more years together. Short selling is what people do when they think that prices are going to drop. So if you own stock and you think the prices are going to drop, you'll simply sell your stock. But if you don't own the stock and you'd like to profit from that information, what you do is you borrow shares from somebody who does have the stock and then you sell it. Now, the reason you need to borrow the shares is because the buyer on the other side of your transaction is going to expect to receive shares. When you sell shares, they're buying them. You have to deliver the shares. And so uh, if indeed you are correct about prices and prices do drop, then what you will do is you will buy back the shares at a lower price and the difference between your sales price, which is high, and the repurchase price, which is low, will be your profits. Now, you also have to pay a little bit to the lender, uh, a lending fee, which is essentially interest for borrowing the shares. Of course, if you're wrong and prices rise, then you lose money, and you can lose money without limit. The most that you can make on a short position is 100%. That's when you sell something for, say, $17, and it drops to zero. But the most that you can lose on a short position is essentially unbounded because if you sell something at 17 and it goes up to perhaps uh, $485 or something like that, you will have lost many, many fold uh, of the amount of money that you originally had in that position. And that's of course is what happened in this uh, short squeeze in GameStop. Okay, but before we move on, can you explain why it's important to have a well-functioning market where people can bet against stocks as well as bet in favor of stocks? So short selling uh, plays an extremely important role in our markets and also in our economy. Short sellers help ensure that the prices of uh, stocks reflect their true fundamental values. And it turns out that most short sellers tend to be right about their opinions. When short sellers are selling, usually prices are of, a, of the security are higher than they should be. And it's often anticipation of uh, news that's not yet public that the short sellers have figured out. So, um, and the reason this is advantageous is twofold. The first reason that... Um, is, is pretty obvious. And the second one is subtle, but uh, far more important. The first reason is, is that if prices go higher than they should be, they will eventually fall because 
reality eventually overtakes everything. When prices are higher than they should be and uninformed traders, simple common investors are buying, they will end up buying securities that are overvalued and when the prices drop, they will lose. And that's not in anybody's interest. They may be foolish when they're doing that, but it's, it's best if they don't lose that money. And we'll probably talk a little while uh, later about why it's undesirable to have foolish people losing money in our markets. Okay, we'll but let's talk get... first about the, the other reason. Okay. When prices go high, companies can often issue new shares. And this happened recently, uh, this last week with AMC. AMC was also pushed up by this uh, Reddit uh, group uh, from uh, Wall Street Bets. And AMC took advantage of the situation and they sold new shares. Now the capital that they raised is capital that isn't gonna go to other uses of capital. So for instance, people working on vaccines or new materials uh, for, uh, for new products or new ideas. Uh, instead, AMC will probably use that money to try to salvage its business, but AMC is in a difficult business right now uh, and may fail regardless. And the reasons why are that now just about, well, lots and lots of people are getting 65 inch screens on their walls to show their movies in 4K resolution, which is essentially as good as what you see in the theater. That plus COVID, which has uh, greatly hurt AMC, um, is, is reducing the value of AMC. And the COVID story has both a direct and an indirect effect. The direct effect, of course, is they've lost sales, but the indirect effect is that it's shown people that they can watch big screen movies on a big screen in their own house at 4K. And so the future prospects of AMC have diminished relative to where they were five years ago. But AMC just got this huge life raft in the form of new capital that they were able to raise uh, because the price was pushed up. And this is problematic because uh, that new capital is, is coming from, or it takes away from capital that, that, that should go to companies that have better ideas and better prospects. So uh, this is why we're concerned about um, protecting short sellers. Short sellers are messengers of, of doom and people like to shoot, shoot short sellers. And that's part of what's been going on here. People have been shooting the short seller. But the truth of the matter is, is that uh, they are actually making our markets more efficient and ensuring ultimately that capital only goes to the people and companies best able to use that, econ that capital for our, for our mutual benefit. The problem that we have with this episode is that these short sellers who've been hurt and others that see how much hurt can be placed on short sellers are now going to withdraw a little bit from the market. And as a consequence, we'll have more uninformed traders buying at higher prices and possibly, very likely, almost certainly, we'll have more capital going to companies that can't use it as well as can other companies. Okay, so short selling is important um, because it leads to more efficient prices, more efficient prices leads to better allocations of capital. Exactly. Okay. Now we have an episode here where the short sellers were hurt. And to understand this, I think we need to understand the concept of a short squeeze. Can you explain yes. what a short squeeze is? So a short squeeze occurs when there typically is a lot of short interest. So short interest is a count of the number of, I'm getting some echo here. A short interest is a count of the number of shares that are, have been um, sold short. And it's usually expressed as a percentage of the total shares outstanding. In uh, GameStop, the short interest was extraordinarily large. It was, uh, I hear, I've seen reports of it being 140% of shares outstanding. I haven't computed that myself, but um, uh, I imagine that uh, whether it was that high or still something smaller, it's still very, very high. Later, if we want, we can talk about how it's possible to have 140% of the shares outstanding short. But for right now, just uh, understand that there was a large number of shares that were short. What happens in a short squeeze is that people start buying aggressively to push the price up. As the price rises, the short sellers are, um, are squeezed in the following sense. 
the lenders uh, who lent the stock to the short sellers have an agreement with the short sellers that says that the short sellers must keep on deposit with the lenders the full current value of the stock. This is to protect the lenders so that if the short seller can't buy the stock back, the lender will buy it back and get the stock back themselves. So as the price of the stock rises, the short sellers have to contribute money, have to put money to the, to the lenders. And so lots and lots of money has to be transferred when a stock goes from $17 to 480 some odd dollars, a massive amount of money. And that money, um, what happens is, as that money's transferred, the short sellers are hurting. And if they cannot continue to fund their losses, then they will be forced to buy back the shares. When they buy back the shares, that pushes the share price up higher. And of course, it locks in their losses and prices rise even further. And so that's a, that's a short squeeze. There's nothing new about this short squeeze. If you read Jesse Livermore's autobiography, The Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, uh, Livermore describes uh, short squeezes from 100 years ago, and even then it wasn't new. Um, so this is a danger of short selling. There, we may talk about some policy uh, things that can be done to, to make it less dangerous, but that's basically what happened. Okay, but, but Larry, there was one, what I think is a key aspect of the short squeeze that you may have glossed over which was there was a shortage in the, in most short squeezes, there's a shortage of shares to be lent. And um, the amount that lenders of shares charge to lender shares, you know, spikes upward. And that happened in the GameStop case. Can you explain right. that a bit? Sure. So the lending fee is determined on a daily basis and uh, where normally it costs just, uh, um, a few percent or even less to borrow shares. Uh, the price of borrowing the, uh, um, the GameStop shares apparently rose to about 40%, or that's what I've heard. I don't know exactly what the number was. Uh, not nearly as high as I would have expected uh, given the uh, short squeeze. Uh, so there's something going on there. I'm not quite sure what was going on. But yeah, the I think it went over 40%. But, but the point is, is I that if I, shorted it, if I shorted it $50 and the price runs up to $400, okay, I'm not only having to pay um, interest on the $50, I'm having to pay interest on the $400. And in addition, instead of having 2% interest, I'm paying 50% interest. Right. So, these, so it's these, a big issues are, these issues are all, are all painful but the interest only accrues on a daily basis. And so even at high rates, it, it's not that high on a daily basis. What's really damaging was all that money that had to be transferred when the stock went from $20 to 400. So basically they had to transfer $380 a share going say right. from 20 to 400. Um, and that transfer had to take place in, you know, every single day as the price is rising. That's enormous. And of course, the fact that the uh, stock was more expensive to um, borrow is just a little additional pain on on the on the, on um, on this uh, this incredible injury. Well, it's an additional pain if you think that things will get resolved in three or four days. But if you think you're going to hold on to this short position for three months, that you know definitely adds up to a big sum. That's of money. correct. It's it's serious pain, and then of course as the price is rising. Um, other people, including the, sh the short sellers, are wishing that they could sell if they if they if they have the financial capital to do so. They're wishing that they could sell short um, at higher prices. So um, when a a stock that has not been above thirty dollars for five years um, now is trading at four hundred dollars in an industry that looks like it's suffering, uh, the problem with GameStop is that. It's a retail stock in an industry where distribution and sales increasingly are taking place over the internet. At a time when COVID is cutting into um, foot traffic, this is a company that's got serious, serious problems. So if you could sell this company at $400, um, 
it's very likely going to drop a lot. And of course, we've seen that it's, you know, it's, it's below 100 now, or at least was a couple hours ago, and probably still lower. So people would have wanted to borrow the stock and sell it, but there's just it was very hard to do. Uh, some people tried to buy puts at that point, but when uh, GameStop was above 400, uh, the puts were $250. It was telling you very clearly that the people selling those puts thought that the that GameStop was going to drop very substantially. Just so everybody's on the page on the same page, a put is an option contract that allows you to sell a stock for a fixed price, say four hundred dollars. So the right to sell a stock at four hundred dollars when the stock is trading at four hundred dollars usually costs, you know, a few dollars, maybe tens of dollars but it's essentially unprecedented for the cost $250. What it means is that people thought the price was going to drop. And of course it would, it's we're in a bubble. Uh, it's artificial and it's as a consequence, pretty darn di uh, disturbing. So maybe I can jump in here. We're getting some questions uh, rolling in that have a fairly, you know, there's, there's a, a theme to them and that also addresses something I was uh, interested in. Uh, we've had the defense of short selling and the role it plays in the market, but there are questions about you know, if a short seller has the capacity to actually move the price. And this is something that was covered a fair amount, somewhat sloppily in the press, although I guess that's not surprising. If you are, if you're able to take a large enough position in a stock where you can move the price, a short seller could in principle profit off of you know, price movements that aren't related to fundamentals, right? And to some extent, yeah, a, a, a squeeze could be one of the disciplining mechanisms that uh, prevent the, the overkill. I think we, we're having some questions about whether it's ethical right. to be taking a short position that moves the stock, whether we really need these this type of thing. So do you have any ideas on that? Well, yes, um, uh, several in fact. Uh, there's several issues that we need to address. So the general question is, um, can short selling be manipulated itself? And the answer is, of course it can be, but it's not, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, generally when short sellers, can short sellers push prices down? Absolutely. Anybody who is trading can push prices one way or the other if they're large enough. Now, if a short seller is pushing prices towards fundamental values, because you've got an overvalued stock, they're doing, they're doing good work. I mean, we hate that they're doing it because nobody likes that negative news, but we really do want prices to reflect information. But what if a short seller pushes prices below fundamental value? Can that be, is that a problem? And of course that's a problem, but there's substantial protection against that. And the protection is that when other people realize that the prices are below fundamental value, the stock is a bargain and there's an entire universe of people who are willing to buy bargains. In contrast, when people push prices up, the only people who can sell are the long holders, many whom are delighted that prices are going up, or people who are selling short, and the short sellers have to borrow the stock, which is burdensome. So on, on balance, you're going to find far more long side manipulations than short side manipulations. And in fact, uh, though the SEC is watching for all types of manipulations, the um, enforcement actions are overwhelmingly long side uh, uh, against long side manipulations that are typically called pump and dumps. This is a this was essentially a pump and dump that was aided by the fact that there was a short squeeze, that, that by squeezing the shorts, they could push the price up substantially. And then they just continued to talk the price up, uh, which is the pumping. And then they then presumably the prime actors uh, sold out at the top and made a lot of money. So they clothe themselves in, um, you know, talking about the democratization of finance. Uh, but in fact, uh, undoubtedly the principal players uh, made a lot of money uh, because this was a scheme that uh, they devised. They found a weakness and they exploited it. Now, a uh, last thing uh, I want to speak. Before, I don't want to. Uh, I want to stop you right there, Larry. Is there any evidence of a ringleader that manipulated um, the Reddit users and made money on this? I have no idea. Uh, surely okay. the SEC will be looking into this as they should. 
uh, if there was um, a collusion uh, to, so if there was a, if there were a group that actually planned to do this, that would be a conspiracy and that would definitely be illegal. But one last quick point on this, uh, which is a, a moral issue. Uh, the people who argue that it's okay to do this because the uh, short sellers uh, uh, engage in manipulative actions themselves are uh, making what's called a moral equivalency argument. That if other people are allowed to do bad, we should be allowed to do bad as well. And society cannot advance on moral equivalency arguments. Unfortunately, we've seen quite a few of those in the last few years, uh, but um, uh, two bads, two wrongs simply do not make a right. So uh, I, I'd actually want to push back a little on within the context of a financial market. Uh, I'm not so sure that's uh, fair in the sense that when, you know, when if one side is manipulating the price, um, the only the, the, the check on that is someone else figuring out, oh, that manipulation is going on and I'm going to figure out my little scheme uh, to undo manipulation. So I'm thinking about um, the, the SOES bandits from the old days when the market makers were being a little dodgy. Um, they figured out how to be a little dodgy in a way that kind of unraveled the dodginess of the market makers. And so it, 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 in some cases in finance, having like the, the people who are up to no good is a disciplining effect. Like for example, yeah, it, it, it's striking to me that short sellers, the, the, the guys who were taking these huge short interest positions we're not doing, sort of, you know, they didn't seem to be doing their risk management very well. And in that sense, like getting people who can't do risk management when they're managing other people's money out of the system seems like a potential socially valuable upside to a squeeze. Um, logically, all that you said is correct. It's a practical matter. Uh, I think that it is um, overwhelmed by the uh, damage that these events are, are causing both to um, uh, uninformed traders who bought on enthusiasm foolishly and also to the short sellers who do much, so much value to our economy. The, um, there's never been a claim here that, they've, that the short sellers in game stock uh, were wrong. Uh, the, there's no question that this company is, um, got problems and it wouldn't surprise anybody. I have no personal information, but it wouldn't surprise anybody if the company declared bankruptcy as have so many other retailers in the last year. And of course, had it declared bankruptcy, the short sellers would have been vindicated and the stock that was trading at 400 would end up trading at 40 cents. Um, and remember again, on average, the short sellers are right. Uh, they obviously got off the reservation because they allowed themselves to become vulnerable to, to this situation and it got out of control and it was very problematic. So but I, I would still, um, most of what we have in finance about markets being efficient and um, you know, the prices reflecting fundamentals relies on sort of an, at least an implicit and usually an explicit assumption that we have small traders who take prices as given and their information aggregates. Like if you look at a microstructure model, that's sort of what it is. And if you have one trader who decides to be large enough in a stock, the, the sort of logic of market efficiency becomes a little more complex and the game theory sort of takes over in a way that makes the, the sort of efficiency that, that, arguments. Well, that, I don't think that was the situation in GameStop. I don't think there were any there were large traders that were manipulating the price, to some extent, the mob well, was manipulating the price in this case, which- um, Well, but, but they were taking large enough short positions without risk management in place that could bring down their funds. And then, you know, we have an awful lot of the shares are held passively. So, it, you know, the-, the So what you're asking for is risk management, that they're supposed to manage risk, the risk that other people will engage in illegal activities uh, and certainly unethical activities. Well, we, we don't know that they're illegal yet, right? We, we know that people were trying to arrange a short, short squeeze. Okay, but there's no question that, there's no question that the people doing this were parasites in the following sense. They were not making prices more informative. 
and they were not um, adding liquidity to the market. So the Sows Bandits story, um, the Sows Bandits were making prices more informative and they were trying to compete with the market makers to add liquidity. And so that's why we should be sympathetic to the efforts of the Sows Bandits. Well, I would say they weren't the trying. Short sellers, the short sellers were placing themselves at very substantial risk when they are selling a stock because there's a world of people who will buy the stock if it's, if it's undervalued. Um, so even if there were only one short seller who was pushing prices down, uh, their risk is that if they're wrong, they will end up losing a lot of money um, because people will trade against it and prices will, will rise. Or the company will simply announce that, you know, what looked like serious problems turn out they're not serious problems. We've got additional financing or sales have returned and the company bounces back and then the short seller gets kicked in the teeth. So the, the operating principle in finance uh, and in capital markets is that people with an opinion put their money where their mouth is. Um, and that is an incredible discipline to ensure that only the people who are well-informed should really be pushing prices around. And what's, what's so frightening about this event is that people who manage to acquire power by virtue of, of their ability to market on, on Reddit and, and rally the troops around some social themes that have nothing to do with the value of GameStop. They have basically violated this basic principle that people who people should, should be rewarded for, for putting their money where their mouth is. The rewards that these people got were, were exploitive in the sense that they were parasites on the system. Um, I understand the frustrations that so many people have about, you know, the bailouts from 2008 and, and tax policy that hurts the small guy and so forth. But this isn't the way to, this is not the proper way to express those frustrations. The right way to express those frustrations is to vote for people who will represent your interests. So Larry, let's go to the next step. Um, a lot of the controversy had to do with the fact that some of the brokers like Robinhood um, basically at some point did not allow um, investors to buy new shares in, in, in um, GameStop. Um, what was the reason for that? Okay, so this is, involves a subtle issue involving um, clearance and settlement of trades. So Robinhood as a broker is responsible for its clients' trades. And uh, it presents the trades to the National Securities Clearing Corp, uh, NSCC, which is a clearinghouse that matches buyers to sellers and acts essentially as an escrow agent, uh, ensuring that, uh, that the buyers produce the money necessary to um, buy the stock and that the stock is delivered by the sellers. That process takes two days now in the United States. There was a time when it was five days, it went down to three days, and now it's just two days. There will be calls to decrease it to one day shortly uh, as a result of this experience. But let me explain why, this, why people will be making those calls. During the period when the, um, between when the trade is done and when it finally settles two days later, if prices drop substantially in, say, GameStop, um, the, uh, um, um, Robinhood still has to pay, say, $400 a share uh, because their traders agreed that they would pay $400 a share. If Robinhood was allowing any of those traders to um, buy on margin, Robinhood may not be able to collect um, money to reflect the losses. So for instance, suppose somebody bought uh, $400 worth of stock, but only put 200 of their own money because Robin Hood lent them another 200. If the price goes from 400 to 40 cents because GameStop announces a bankruptcy, then uh, that trader will have lost $400, which will be 200 of their own money and 200 of, of money that uh, they still owe to Robin Hood. Now, if Robin Hood can't, can't collect that money and there's no way that they could do so quick enough, 
um, then, uh, then Robin Hood wouldn't be able to settle its trade. Robin Hood would be in default and the clearinghouse would get hurt and the other members of the clearinghouse would be responsible for making it good. To protect itself, clearinghouses have rules that say that you must post margin when you're clearing trades with us. So we're, we want a deposit on, on account that's proportional to the size of the trades that you are clearing with us. And so when Robinhood was doing so much business, Robinhood's margins at um, NSCC, the required margins were increasing, both because of the size of the business, but also because NSCC was increasing the re margin requirement, the percentage requirement, because of the additional risk involved, which was entirely prudent. Okay, um, so two, two so points here. Now, the final, the final yes, the final issue is that um, even if Robin Hood wasn't lending the money. Uh, Robin Hood still has to pay the margins. And here's the kicker. The margins have to be paid out of Robin Hood's capital. They cannot use customer capital for this purpose. Because if they use customer capital for this purpose, uh, it could be lost and that would hurt the customers. So the requirement is that Robin Hood pay uh, money out of their own capital to make these margin calls and they simply ran out. And so when they ran out, what they had to do is they had to get more, but until they could get more, they had to prevent their clients from buying more shares or opening more short positions. So Robinhood didn't stop their clients from trading. They just said the only trades you can do are trades that close positions. So there was nothing illegal involved even though Robin Hood's going to get sued on this issue, uh, they will survive this easily. Um, it's just a risk management issue. And if the customers didn't like it, then they should go to another broker that's better capitalized. Um, so, um, uh, okay. So uh, again, um, so your claim is there's nothing nefarious here. Um, Robin Hood was basically forced to do what they did. Um, Robin Hood didn't force anyone to sell their positions. Nope. So there was no net selling, um, but they certainly had an effect on net buying. So how did GameStop, GameStop stock price respond when Robin Hood stopped taking new buy orders? So when uh, Robin Hood stopped taking new buy orders, along with a few other brokers, the price of GameStop, dro the Game stock dropped 75%. So, okay, it's so it just, dropped seventy five percent. There was no additional selling pressure; they just turned off the buying pressure. Right, and, and that's so, our, that's a clearest evidence that this was essentially a Ponzi scheme. What was going on is that people bought in, hoping that they could make the money that they heard their neighbors had made, hoping that prices would go up, with the expectation that they'll sell out when other people buy in. And so, as long as new people are continuing to buy in, and there's momentum. People jump in to be there. And the problem is, is that momentum cannot continue forever. There comes a point when there simply aren't more new buyers, either because of a regulatory problem with, with Robin Hood, or simply because people just get too scared and the people who've got positions start selling them saying, I've made enough already, this is too risky. At some point it comes to an end. And when it comes to an end, the price drops. And this, of course, is what we've seen all of this week now, is that now uh, GameStop is it's headed back towards, you know, 17, 20 bucks. It may take a little while to get there, but everybody is sitting there saying, oh, it's going to come back. We're going to do this again. You know, it saw it before. They're very likely to be disappointed. OK, now, before we talk at all about regulating these markets, um, isn't it likely that this is sort of a, a once in a decade type situation that the short sellers were basically um, taken by surprise because no one had ever organized a Reddit crowd to um, effectively squeeze the short sellers before. And going forward, people are going to be more careful about this. Um, and again, as, um, as we were saying before, the hedge funds will have better risk management because this is a risk that they will take into account. And it's unlikely that we're going to see the situation propping up here and there going forward. 
So that's so, my point for being less concerned. Um, yes. What's your argument for being more concerned? Okay, well, uh, several, several reasons. Uh, first of all, you're absolutely right. Um, when faced with this type of risk, anybody who's thinking about a short position is going to be more cautious. The trouble is, is again, we need short sellers to help discipline uh, markets because that's essential to capital allocation. So it's problematic having the short sellers withdraw, but they will withdraw. The probability of this happening again in the same magnitude is pretty small. In fact, we even see, saw that they tried to do it with silver and it doesn't seem to have worked. Um, another thing we need to point out, it's not only hedge funds who go short. Lots of people do. Lots of long, short institutional funds go short. It's not just the hedge funds. And another thing to point out, even if we focus only on the hedge funds, the hedge funds are funded. They have a, the accounts in the hedge funds are by and large pension funds. So you've got public pension funds, you've got private pensions funds, you've got the policemen, the teachers, the plumbers, the electricians. Their investments in these hedge funds lost a lot of money. And as a consequence, a lot of common people are going to end up retiring a little less well than they otherwise would be because these parasites, I think that's the proper term, have um, essentially taken from them. Now, they, whether it was legal or not, it certainly wasn't ethical, um, but that's just my opinion. Uh, other people can form their own opinion of ethics as well. But, the, but our markets are extraordinarily important to the welfare of this country. I don't like to see regulation. Um, I prefer to see free markets. But what, what I really prefer are competitive markets that operate and produce efficient prices and, liquid, and lots of liquidity so that the markets can do what they're supposed to do. When so people do think use the markets for their own benefit um, without adding liquidity or making price efficiency, that just doesn't strike me as something that's right. Okay, so we currently have laws against short squeezes and manipulation and, you know, all those things that happened in this particular case. Um, are the current regulations sufficient? And, um, you know, some people may get prosecuted for this, maybe yes, maybe no, but we don't really need new policy here. Or has this basically shown that um, we need to think seriously about new policy? Um. So first of all, let me talk about the prospects for prosecution, and then we'll talk about policy issues. So to prove um, market manipulation, you have to prove a concept called scienter, which means uh, basically evil intent. Um, so uh, um, unless there, was, there were people who actually spoke to, this is what we intend to do, and this is why we're, gonna, why we're doing it, and this is what's going to happen, that this was all designed it, it is often very difficult to prove scienter. So that will be a challenge here. Although, um, although it, they will certainly try to do that. Um, whether they're able to do that um, also will depend on their tolerance for taking on this group because they've clothed themselves in democratic values. Uh, that nobody wants to appear that they are resisting a democratic movement. Um, but that's, that's insidious. Uh, I just don't see that this is an issue of, of democratization of finance. It's, it's just a plain, simple manipulation. Um, okay, so now the question about public policy issues. There's a number of things that can be done uh, that are not costly uh, that would improve our markets. So first of all, um, we could be reporting short interest on a daily basis instead of on a uh, bi-monthly basis, twice a month. Bi-monthly is semi-monthly, is that correct? I mean, twice a month, I think, is semi-monthly. Um, so it's presently reported on the 15th and on the last day of the month. And short interest, again, is the total number of shares that have been borrowed and uh, sold uh, and held overnight as a short position. Um, by the way, short selling is enormous in the markets, but you never see it. Uh, a dealer who doesn't have shares often sells short and then buys them back moments later. The uh, short sale is a short sale and it counts towards the total of short volume, which often can approach 50% and that's completely meaningless because uh, it's all covered. 
So short interest is only the volume that is, it continues to be held, the short, uh, share, short shares that are outstanding uh, as of the uh, evening when uh, trading closes. So if we reported short interest on a daily basis, we'd at least see what was happening. And at a minimum, the brokers could see whether problems were starting to form. So that would allow brokers to avoid getting into the capital problems that we saw uh, Robin Hood uh, have. The stock loan market can be made a lot more efficient. This is a technical issue uh, that we probably need not spend much time talking about here, but it doesn't operate very efficiently. If it were made to operate more efficiently, um, then the probability of a short squeeze would decline. On the other hand, though, the potential for um, manipulation by short sellers would also uh, increase. But there is very little manipulation by short sellers. They're accused of it all the time because corporate executives hate the messenger when the, when the information's bad news. Um, and, um, and it's and just, again, nobody likes short sellers because they're bringing bad news. But I, I want to jump in on that. Like if, if we could go back to 2008, it was actually, it was exactly the. Um, short sellers were right. Yeah. And, and it was the uh, insider finance people who were going after the short sellers and even got the SEC to ban short selling on their shares. So in 2008, the, you, your, your Goldman's and your Merrill's were all, you know, the short sellers are evil and got the SEC to actually not let them short right. the financial stocks, right? And okay, that so there are situations where short selling can be um, manipulative and very dangerous. Uh, and the SEC is of course aware of that. The most serious situation is when uh, a company has issued bonds uh, that have a covenant on the bond, a, a, a feature that says, if the equity drops below a certain value, the um, bad things are gonna happen to the company, that new financing will be required or something like that. And, um, and when that happens, uh, if that event occurs, then the shares drop, the equity drops further because of the occurrence of that event. So a short seller who can push prices down to trigger that event uh, then creates the opposite of a short squeeze. It's a manipulation and that's a, that's a big problem. Those contracts largely do not exist anymore, though we had them in 2008. And um, they were manipulated and that was a problem. Also, when short sellers push prices down, companies that need to raise new capital have difficulty doing so. On the other hand, remember again that if a company has good prospects, buying shares is very, very attractive to anybody who knows that. And again, anybody in the world who wants to buy shares usually can do so. But when it comes to selling short uh, or, or selling stock, only if you have a long position or only if you're willing and able and qualified with buy capital to sell short, uh, will you be able to sell short? So there's a huge asymmetry in, um, in whether we expect prices to be overvalued or undervalued. They're so far we, more likely to be overvalued than undervalued. So would you, would you defend the SEC's intervention on short selling in 2007, 2008, or do you think that was? No, it was wrong. Okay. They just did it because there was political pressure. Yeah. And, yeah, so and, what happens, let me explain how it happens. So a CEO who's given a lot of money to the um, both parties and to a bunch of senators calls up his favorite senator and say, and says, these short sellers are evil at a time when the uh, market's dropping, they're pushing prices down and they're going to, they're causing a perfectly good business such as ours uh, to, to go into distress. Now the guy may be worried more about his stock options than about the business. I mean, he's got a solid business. It'll recover. Okay. But for whatever reason, so, and the Senator doesn't understand this Senator, you know, or may understand it and doesn't care. I mean, either way, the Senator uh, uh, calls up the SEC or writes a letter and says, what's going on here. And the SEC at some point says, it just isn't worth fighting. So that's happened before. And it, it, it does put like some of the instincts that people have here that insiders in the financial sector are rigging the game. That's a lot of the, story. Not all of that is paranoia, right? There are plenty of examples where um, 
you know, I, I study IPR. I used to study IPOs a fair amount, and they've clearly been rigging the IPO game for decades. With uh, you know, the spreads are collusive, and the underpricing is you know, that's that's not above board, right? So some of it's the hard to say about the underpricing, but the, the spreads. Um, I will. I the will spreads go to my do deck. seem like they're um, large, and the, there are mechanisms are, that enforce what's what might be termed a tacit collusion. Um, so, in general, uh, does big money have power? Uh, big money very often does have power. So, so uh, let's talk about big money for one second. Um, some of the people in the chat have um, wanted to talk about um, Elon Musk and the short sellers in Tesla. And um, is that really that different? Um, Elon Musk basically getting their troops to buy Tesla, propping up Tesla stock. Um, and in some sense, you've got what almost looks like a short squeeze in certain situations on Tesla. No, nothing nearly as dramatic. No. Um, but is it really that much different? Elon Musk has an enormous interest in keeping the price of Tesla high and getting it even higher. If he can bring the price above a trillion and hold uh, the market cap above a trillion and hold it there for a month, uh, he gets, I forget the exact terms, but I think he gets 20% of the shares outstanding or something like that. Uh, which for the world's wealthiest person is, is an, an incredible addition to his wealth. Um, and in addition, uh, when Tesla shares are at high prices, Tesla can issue uh, new shares and get a lot of money and thereby finance itself. Now, there's no question that Tesla is a great company. Okay, they're producing a product that it has some problems, but it's certainly innovative. Uh, Consumer Reports is presently down on it, but they were once very high on it. And there's no, you know, and the technology is, is selling. But right now, Tesla is worth more than any other uh, car company in the world, including Toyota that sells uh, like 15 million cars. I think it's worth as much as all the other auto companies combined. That's possible. I don't know. Okay, so that's pretty darn remarkable when you consider the fact that uh, all these other companies are going to build electric cars as well. And building electric cars involves a lot of knowledge, but it isn't quite rocket science. Okay. okay. And but, but Tesla is probably dollar wise is the most shorted company in the world. And um, perhaps and because uh, again, is, are we seeing short squeezes in Tesla to some extent or. Well, I mean, people who, people who bought early on, um, the price has gone up a lot and they've lost, I'm sorry, people who shorted early on, the price has gone up very substantially right. and they've lost an awful lot of money. Meanwhile, with the price high, Tesla has issued shares at prices that many people, myself included, are above its value. Tesla's gonna face a lot of competition. I mean, right. GM just announced that by 2035, they're gonna basically be all electric or maybe some hydrogen as well. Uh, um, and, you know, Volkswagen's working on it. Uh, and all of them are, you know, they're not, they're having hiccups along the way, but they're going to figure it out. And so Tesla undoubtedly is going to drop. I would be extraordinarily. Undoubtedly, worried. come on. <laughs> well, How much are you short? <laughs> <laughs> I am short Tesla. Um, so why undoubtedly? Is because, I mean, there's no so question. That's a strong statement to make, Larry. It is very strong. Okay, so the, clearly there is a possibility that uh, Tesla may maintain its prices. Here's the story for how Tesla maintains its price. They become a dominant player in an industry uh, that, that is changing to their technology. Everybody uh, recognizes how good they are and uh, everybody wants to have a Tesla. And on top of it, they make money on their solar. And on top of it, they make money because the yeah, you know, it's, it's instructive to note that Tesla doesn't make any profits without the payments they receive from other car, make, uh, car manufacturers for carbon credits right. or, or other regulatory payments. So without that, you know, Tesla wouldn't even be making profit. So perhaps under a democratic administration and more pressure throughout the world to deal with uh, warming, uh, those payments become even more valuable and Tesla makes money and I lose it. But my, my guess is that it will fall apart. Um, even Elon Musk himself a month ago said 
that we have to be very careful. He wrote email to his workers saying that if we slip up anywhere along, now, along the way, we're going to be ravaged by the market. <laughs> well, I mean, any slip up, it means that he knows how precarious the position is. And anybody holding a long position in Tesla should be concerned about that. But remember, also, I have a short position, so I'm speaking my self-interest. You're talking in your book here. <laughs> yes, but I'm also, I'm also, my first loyalty right now is to this webinar and to its, um, its viewers. And so the fact that I'm short, uh, it's important for you to recognize it, but uh, the position is not so large that it's making any difference in my wealth or that it would make any difference in my wealth. Um, that said, you know, price has gone up and I've lost money and I'm not happy about that. Okay. Um, we've got a lot of people. I wouldn't mind having a few questions from the audience. I'm not sure exactly how to manage that. Um, Megan, do you, is there an easy way I can take a few questions? Um, did we want to do it through the, the Q and A or did you want to bring, allow somebody to talk and bring them on? Um, I, if there's someone that wants to voice a question, I'd be willing to take a couple of those. Um, so if anybody wants it to be, be allowed to speak, um, just uh, use the raise your hand function and um, we can promote you. In the meantime, I see that there are some questions in the Q&A box and let me answer, let me answer one of them that I just saw. Uh, so the question says, um, what does it mean when short interest is above 100%? And what are the ramifications of this situation? So uh, let me explain how short interest can get above 100%. Again, I've been told that it was, but I haven't actually looked at the numbers myself. The numbers are publicly available and so you can figure it out. So here's how short interest gets to be above 100%. So um, I have some shares uh, and I lend them to a short seller. The short seller sells those shares and now somebody else buys those shares. The person who buys those shares now owns them and that person lends them to a short seller. The short seller then sells those shares and somebody else now buys them. You see the same shares are going round and round and they're being lent out repeatedly. What's going on is that as the short interest builds, their uh, corresponding to the short interest is the stock loan and also corresponding to the short interest, I should remind you, is increasing long interest. When there is 100% of the, say 150% of the shares, or let's say 140 is the number I've heard. Suppose 140% of the shares are, are held short, okay? That means that 240% of the shares outstanding are being held by long holders because for every buyer, there's always a seller. So we have 100% um, of, sh of real shares out there and 140% of stock loan where people think they own the stock but it's actually been lent by their broker. And there's nothing wrong with that because you're gonna get the, the value back. Uh, and um, so you got 240% you got of the shares outstanding held by long holders uh, of which 100% are represented by actual shares and 140% have been lent out. And the short, the short sellers have lent, are, represent 140% of short interest. So we often focus on that 140% forgetting that there's 240% that's held by long holders. Are they manipulating the price up? Well, possibly, maybe so. What are the ramifications? It, um, unraveling this can be complicated. Uh, and um, basically it's a sticky situation in clearance and settlement as prices drop, people, People call the loans back in or something like that. It's, it's, it's dangerous. There's another element of a classic short squeeze, as long as we're talking about short squeezes that we should talk about, is that uh, the squeezer may lend, uh, will buy up a lot of shares, then lend them out, then promote the stock, and then call back the loan. When they call back the loan, they require the uh, short seller to buy back in. If they, can't, if they can't borrow it someplace else. So in a small stock, a penny stock fraud, that's the normal situation. The manipulator uh, is uh, basically running the show, uh, controls most of the float. They lend the stock out as bait uh, when the stock is overpriced. Uh, then they run up the stock even more, call the shares back and 
that forces the shorts to buy back because they can't get the shares anywhere. So uh -huh. when that who? constellation of events happens, of course, the SEC jumps in quickly as it should. Who is the traditional squeezer in something like that? Um, in penny stocks, the the squeezer are, are, are penny stock operators. Used to be that all happened in Vancouver. And so to some extent it still does. Um, uh, under uh, the, um, uh, huh, name just dropped out of my head. Our last chairman of the SEC, um, Clayton, Jay Clayton. Uh, Jay Clayton uh, was very concerned about, uh, and, and his predecessors as well. The SEC has been very concerned about penny stock fraud. Uh, it's basically just been a game. Uh, I'll give you an example of some of the craziness happens in penny stock fraud. I once saw a junior miner. A junior miner is a small company that uh, explores for minerals. Junior miner was uh, going after uranium when the price of uh, yellow cake, which is uh, uranium uh, trioxide or something like that, um, when the price had sky skyrocketed through the roof because the price of oil had gone very high. And so everybody in their third cousin was prospecting for uranium. This little uranium company in its 10K in which they uh, revealed their risks indicated that uh, their primary asset was merely an option on land in, um, in Argentina um, that had already been heavily prospected. So what does it mean that land is heavily prospected and they can get an option on prospecting it further? It means that other people couldn't find any uranium there. And as a consequence, you know, so they were just selling a dream. So you got people selling a dream, trying to get people to buy it, pushes up the price and then they sell and that's done. So it's basically a marketing game. Um, so, uh, one, one, la should... one, one last topic, Larry, there's been some questions about sort of this relationship between Robinhood and Citadel and Citadel buying the order flow from Robinhood. What does that mean exactly? Okay. And maybe if we could just find out what happens exactly when somebody goes onto Robinhood and buys a share of stock, because it's not, it's not actually that simple, right? Yes. Okay, so, uh, and it's an interesting story and it's another thing that needs to change. Robinhood, when they collect orders from their clients, they have to go out and fill those orders. They could send them to a stock exchange, but they typically don't. Instead, they send them to Citadel and to other um, dealers that are called uh, wholesale dealers. And they send them to these dealers because the dealers pay Robinhood to get Robinhood to send them these orders. So the dealers say, we will fill your customers' orders and we'll pay you for the privilege of doing that. Okay, so uh, Robinhood takes these payments and they use these payments to defer the cost of running the business. And it allows Robinhood to tell their clients, you can trade with us commission free as though trading were free. Of course, there is no free lunch. This is a hidden pipeline of revenue. So why is, why is uh, Citadel and others willing to do this? Because they, like, they make a lot of money off of trading with retail clients. And they kick back some of it. And I didn't, I chose the word carefully. They kick that back to Robinhood. And the SEC has said that this is legal. But in any other context, this would be an illegal kickback. If as the purchasing officer for my university, Southern California, if I was asked to go out and buy chairs for the university, and I told the vendors of chairs, uh, USC wants to buy shares, uh, chairs, what prices you offer? Oh, and by the way, if you want to buy the chairs, you have to pay me to do so. That would be a felony. But in the case, is, is, is Robin, is Citadel allowed to use the information from um, the Robin Hood trades to basically make trades on their own? Citadel makes money two ways, uh, just as you described. After the trade takes place, they can take that information into account when deciding what they want to do uh, in their own proprietary trading. They cannot front run an order that's not been filled. That's illegal. But once the order has been filled, they can use that information to figure out what's likely to happen in the future. 
And retail traders tend to behave like uh, herds of cattle. They all move in the same direction, or maybe a flock of birds is a little bit more polite, but they tend to move in the same direction. So if you see some movement, there's likely to be more movement. When Citadel sees that, uh, and others who play a similar game, they try to get in front of that. Okay, so that's, that's a legal form of front running, but it's not very ethical. It's, the ethical problem is on Robinhood. Robinhood knows that this is happening, or if they don't know, they, they're deliberately ignorant. Um, and, uh, and so, so that's Robinhood's not unique in that. Um, Pardon? There Robin are Hood, lots of them are doing it, but not all. doing that. Everyone's doing that. Not everybody, but lots of them do it. Uh, interactive brokers. Again, remember, I'm a director of interactive brokers. We do it for a small number of our clients that want to trade zero commission. But historically, we've never done it because we didn't think it was right. Um, now, uh, Citadel also makes money on the bid ask spread. They buy at low prices and sell at higher prices. And that spread allows them to make money. And they've discovered that historically, they can make a lot of money doing that when trading with retail clients. Because on average, retail clients tend not to be well informed about fundamental values. That doesn't so if I mean- buy a, If I buy a hundred shares on Robinhood and they sell those shares to Citadel, sell my order to Citadel, how much does Robinhood get paid for that? Do you have so, any idea? So a typical arrangement um, has um, a wholesaler paying the uh, retailer uh, about 50, mill, I believe, um, per share. It's a very small amount with the following um, arrangement. They tell, the, they tell the broker, you tell us how much of this money do you want to receive as payment for order flow? And how much of it should we allocate to improving prices for your customers? So if the market is 20 bid and 21 offered, and somebody comes in to buy uh, with a market order, it will trade at 21. But if Citadel, Citadel can trade it at say 20.95 or even 20 point, you know, 20.75 or something like that. And um, so uh, Robin Hood in that negotiation will still tell Citadel, uh, here's how we'd like it to uh, divide it. Give our clients a piece of it uh, and give us the rest. The reason for giving the clients a piece of it is to appease the SEC. Robin Hood has to claim that they're getting best execution for those orders. And the standard of best executions, look, the client got no worse than they would if they went to NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, where the market was 20 bid, 21 offered. In fact, they're doing better. Uh, so we're, we've done a service for the client and uh, we're giving them zero commissions. Now, what's the problem with zero commissions, aside from the fact that it's essentially dishonest because the client's paying for it one way or the other, is that it has emboldened people to believe that they can trade without consequence. Now, you and I think that's kind of crazy, but everything, you know, if you know that every time you trade, you got to pull money out of your pocket, that will, that will inhibit your trading. And so as a first move, we should get rid of payment for order flow if you, want the, if you want the clients to get better prices, why don't we split the tick to a half penny? In fact, and this is an entirely different story, there already is a de facto half penny tick. And this has to do with how exchanges price their services, which would take this another 15 minutes to fully explain. But that de facto half penny tick benefits these, um, these proprietary traders and hurts everybody like you and I. Uh, so we could level the field by putting everybody into an environment where there's a half penny tick, get rid of payment for order flow, and uh, restore minimal but, but reasonable uh, commissions. But think of how difficult it would be for the SEC to say, I want to raise commissions for everybody. That's crazy. It's just, it's really hard. They can't be in that position. And yet they should be closing a hidden pipeline that is creating agency problems where the, where the responsibility of Robin Hood and, and every other broker is to get the best available price. And instead they're taking a kickback and taking a piece of it. And the claim is that they're getting a better price when in fact the client should be getting an even better price. 
So the claim is that getting a better price because you get an execution you're buying at, at um, say 20.75 instead of at uh, 21. So that's a better price. But point of fact is they maybe should be buying at 20.5 or some other intermediate price. We can change the markets through a careful specification of market structures to make us all better off. It may hurt some proprietary traders. If, the, if the, we wanna truly democratize finance and make these markets work well, we need to do the sensible things, but we should be well-informed and it should be done through the political process. You got millions of people who need to be writing letters to the SEC um, explaining that we can't tolerate stupidity in the market. We've got to make the markets work. So if I could jump in back one more time to kind of come to the defense, I guess, or play devil's advocate for the, um, the mob, as you called them, it seems unlikely that any of that would have ever been fixed until something like this happened. I mean, and you see this in finance and history, like something, you know, institutions get kludged together. They're not really that great and nothing ever gets fixed until someone figures out the exploit that really like points out where the problem is. Like this payment for order flow was gonna go on forever and these guys were gonna keep taxing retail investors forever if they didn't get, you know, if one of their funds didn't get kind of hit by this sort of institutional ickiness, right? So to some extent, this may be an institutional, institutionally efficient, even if it's not sort of- It's a political economy issue that, yeah. um, Often get people messy. think things are good enough as they are until it goes bad. And then, then you have the danger that there'll be an overreaction. An overreaction here would be a call for a transaction tax. Transaction costs would be very, very damaging to the markets and to capital formation. But, you know, our senators and our congressmen, they are very smart people, but they can't know everything. And they're asked to basically opine and act on every aspect of our economy and our social welfare and notions of fairness and so forth. And in the end, uh, they just will end up doing coarse things, coarse policy. And so that's dangerous. Um, if you have time, I'll share a very quick story um, from my service at the SEC. One of the things that I spent the most time on was an attempt to prevent the potential for a fraud and actually a squeeze actually uh, in a new instrument where there was really little chance of it happening, but I recognized that it could happen from earlier precedents. And I had to fight all sorts of people to um, establish a rule that would prevent this from happening. And I did indeed uh, win that fight. And I can boast that here was one case where we managed to do the right thing before the problem came. And of course, the problem is, is that the problem never came and nobody ever appreciated it. So, <laughs> yeah. A little bit of a boast, but um, the so, truth so Larry, is it may never have come and probably was a waste of my time. I'm going to give you one last question. Um, and I see it in the chat a couple times and I have no idea what it is. So uh, maybe you can oh, educate me. Too. Um, people are talking about something called ladder attacks. Are you familiar with that? Um, so in trading, a ladder usually means when when people place um, orders at different prices or in bonds, uh, it's what you uh, ladder is a bonds at different maturities. So I, I um, in, when you wanna form a group identity, what you do is you create a language that uh, is exclusive to the group. And so now we have something that Sheridan, you've been involved in finance and not so far from trading for you know, 40 plus years and you never heard of this. And I'm involved in trading and I have a pretty good guess as to what this is, but I'm not positive. That doesn't make me ignorant. I mean, I know a lot about trading. I'm pretty sure I know what this is. But what's going on here is they're talking about a strategy that the in people know about. And this is just part of the rhetoric of building group identity. Why is group identity so important here? Because to manipulate prices like this and to get other people to follow you so that you can get the manipulation to work and perhaps most importantly, so that you can get out and let them lose, uh, you have to get them to identify with your movement. 
And so you're going to see a lot of stuff like laddering and whatnot. whatnot. It's just another strategy. Uh, and it, uh, there's, you know, the basics of the story are people bought a lot, pushed the prices up against short sellers, continued to push prices up in what subsequently became essentially a pump and dump, and then prices have dropped. And how it happened is, you know, you can talk about various strategies and stuff like that, but there's not a lot of substance here beyond the observation that creating, creating exclusive language tends to um, make for a more cohesive uh, group and where group identity is really important, this is the type of thing you see. Now, I don't know that there was a really smart person who designed all of this. Sometimes things just happen because it all comes together, but that doesn't mean that the analysis is any less valid. Okay, one last prediction, three months from now, is this going to be something that's you know, basically been forgotten or are we going to get a number of GameStop type um, situations in the next few months? I don't think we'll have too many of these, uh, more of these events. People will still be talking about it. Academics will be writing papers about it for the next five years. And regulators uh, will be holding uh, hearings to discuss what to do. Uh, and perhaps, and uh, certainly the uh, Congress will uh, pay some attention to it. Congress will certainly pay attention to it if they want a distraction from more important business. This is very important business and it deserves their attention, but, um, they often attend to uh, market structure issues just because uh, they want a distraction from, they don't want to do other things. So <laughs> that's a pretty negative view, but, uh, but uh, you know, that's how politics often works. Uh, I thought you were going to ask me for my prediction for GameStop's price uh, uh, three months from now. My guess is it's somewhere near where it started. Uh, maybe a little bit higher, maybe a little bit lower. It all depends on whether GameStop is able to issue shares at these uh, uh, prices. AMC is going to be uh, more highly priced uh, in the future than it, we otherwise would have had because they were able to issue shares at a high price, adding to their assets. Um, and then when the prices drop, they won't drop as much because they now have more assets. <laughs> okay, so. Any other predictions you want to make? <laughs> the sun will rise tomorrow for sure. Somewhere. Okay, you got a prediction on um, Tampa Bay versus um, Kansas City Chiefs? Yeah, one of the teams will likely win. I, they don't have any more ties in football, right? They do. Um, Probably not. <laughs> that shows you, shows you how old I am. There was a time when there used to be ties in football. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Larry. This is always great to have a conversation with you. I always learn a lot. And um, hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. Sure. Thanks very much. Be well. Okay. And trade okay. carefully if you're going to trade.